Hello, and welcome back to Pete's Behavioural Insights and Theories, aka Pete's Bits. You may have heard that psychology is going through a bit of a rough time right now. We're in the middle of something we call the replication crisis. And what we're finding is that many of the original studies, work that we thought was seminal and very important, is failing replication tests left, right, and center. And it's a big problem for psychologists, right? Because replicability is an indicator of validity. If we can't replicate our results, then how can we say that our results are valid? And if you had to pick one subfield of psychology and say that this was the poster boy for the replication crisis, almost undoubtedly you would pick priming. So that's what we're talking about in today's video. Priming, past, present, and future. So if you're excited to hear about priming, please can you subscribe to this channel by hitting that red subscribe button down below and ring that notification bell if you haven't already. Okay, let's get on with the video. So what is priming? Priming is an idea that came out of the 70s, and the idea is that I can get you to recognize words faster if I first introduce to you a related word. So if I was trying to get you to recognize the word doctor as a word, I could first introduce to you the word nurse. The idea is that by introducing the word nurse first, I'm kind of warming up your neural circuitry around the word doctor, since they are related words. Then, when I want you to retrieve the word doctor from memory as being a real word, you're able to do so much more quickly. Now this basic word relation area of priming research is pretty well established. They call this semantic priming. But where priming gets a little bit more sticky is when psychologists have been claiming that priming can lead to behavior change. This branch of priming research has been dubbed social priming or behavioral priming. And previous researchers have claimed that you can prime people's behavior with subtle cues before they engage in a task. Perhaps the most famous study of this example is conducted by Barg et al. in 1996. In this study, participants were given a word scrambling task, but what they didn't know is that this word scrambling task was actually a primer for the next task, in which they were simply asked to walk down a hallway. You see, some participants were given a word scrambling task that resulted in them scrambling neutral words, whereas the other participants were given a word scrambling task that resulted in words related to old people. Words like bingo, wrinkle, and Florida, because this study was taking place in the United States, were all words associated with being old, and what they found was that when students later walked down the hallway, those students who were primed with words related to being old actually walked down the hallway slower. And this isn't the only bizarre finding in priming research. Other examples include people who are primed with ideas of money act in a more selfish manner, Another is if you prime people with words related to professors, then they actually perform better on quizzes. And perhaps the most hilarious example of social priming is that if you introduce a fishy smell into a room, then people in that room will subsequently be more suspicious of the people around them. They literally think they're more fishy. And eventually, priming made it into the most prevalent of social science literature. Here's my copy of Thinking Fast and Slow. And if you look at chapter four, The Associative Machine, it's all about priming. And in the book, Kahneman uses the old man walking down the hallway study, as well as the money prime making people more selfish example too. But unfortunately, they all failed replication tests. In 2012, Doyen et al. tried to recreate Bug's classic walking down the hallway study. They replicated the procedure, but were not able to replicate the results. People who were primed with words to do with old people walked down the hallway just as fast as those other people who weren't primed with words to do with old people. Except in one condition. That is the condition when the observers who are recording the time are told to expect the old people to walk slower. Basically, when the study is not conducted in a double-blind manner. You see, double-blind experiments are really important because if you're expecting a certain result and you want a certain result to be true, then that itself is a bias that could lead to poor quality data. For example, in the money leading to people being selfish experiment, a recent replication effort was led by Doug Rohrer and found that students who were primed with money performed no differently than people who were not primed with money. So, in light of all of these failed replications, Daniel Kahneman himself had to admit that the studies used in thinking fast and slow were underpowered and inconclusive. Kahneman even wrote in response to a blog written by Andrew Galman that there was a special irony to him making this mistake, because the first paper that him and Tversky published was about the law of small numbers, and how we can make false conclusions based off large effect sizes from very small samples. He wrote, our article was written in 1969 and published in 1971, but I failed to internalize its message. 
So what's going on here? Why are so many priming studies failing to replicate? Well, in a quantitative analysis that came out of Germany, the authors find three main reasons why priming results don't, and won't, replicate. The first reason is that primes rely on associative relationships within our mind. Therefore, in order for a prime to work, it will only really work for one specific culture. As time goes on and culture evolves, we can't really expect the same primes to still be working. The second reason why replications fail to get the same results are because they're conducted in different languages to the original, and language really is a fundamental aspect of how priming works. Different languages have different associations between words, and therefore the primes can't really be expected to work when translated into a different tongue. Even in the Doyen study, which was trying to replicate Barg's study, of people walking down a hallway slowly. That study was conducted in French with French speakers, and that could be one of the reasons why the study didn't work, because the original study was conducted in American English. And finally, if priming is going to work, it would have to work based on learned relationships, things that we have learned to associate in memory through experience and learning through time. And therefore, even if you were to test the same people, but at two different points in their lifespan, the same primes are not likely to work twice. And that's because the associations that we form within our memory change through time and through our experience. So is that it then? Should priming be the next victim of cancel culture? We're cancelling priming and social psychology. Well, no, I wouldn't go that far. There's still a lot of exciting priming research that's being done today with far more reliable methods and getting far more reliable results. More recent studies have moved the focus away from universal priming, priming that affects everybody, and instead the focus has changed to priming people who already care about the thing they're being primed about. For example, in a 2016 study, if you took a group of people who wanted to be thinner, and you primed them with ideas like diet, thin figure, and thin, they would actually go on to make healthier food choices. But it only worked for people who really cared about dieting. If you were someone who didn't care about losing weight or dieting, then this had no effect on your behavior at all, you would still choose the unhealthy food choices. And in a 2015 meta-analysis of priming effects from the University of Illinois, they found that priming does seem to affect people, but the effect sizes are far smaller than what was originally claimed by those old studies. And in this meta-analysis, they only used studies which directly related to the behavior being primed. So for example, if you wanted to get people to walk slowly down a hallway, you would have to prime them with words that related to being slow directly and not an indirect relationship like being old. So here are some closing thoughts from today's video. Firstly is that early priming studies were pretty bad. They had underpowered sample sizes, they weren't conducted with double blind conditions, and so even though they were used in thinking fast and slow, don't take that to be a measure of a valid study, because even Kahneman himself in hindsight admits that these studies were pretty bad. The second lesson is that replicating priming studies is really hard. Even if you replicate the procedure, it's really hard to replicate the specific culture in time that that original study was conducted in. Even if you were to conduct the same study in exactly the same way, with exactly the same participants, but you just did it 20 years down the line, those participants will be completely different, living in a different time era, and therefore a different culture. So basically, we can't really expect priming studies to replicate well, ever. And finally, on a more positive note, priming isn't complete nonsense. Modern studies have shown that priming does have an effect on people's behavior, but they're far more mild than what we originally anticipated. And they seem to only really work if the people really care about the issue they're being primed about. So my advice to you is that if you're designing a behavioral intervention, you probably don't want to be using priming as one of your main tools of influence. It's unreliable, unpredictable, and even if it works right now, it probably won't work as time goes by. I know priming is the P in mind space, but maybe just pretend it says mind says. Hey, congratulations, you made it to the end of the video, and I'm glad you did because I really want to tell you about next week's video. I recently had the privilege of speaking to one of today's most renowned psychologists, and that's Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. She's an expert on false memories, and her work has been used in loads of high-profile cases, including Ted Bundy, Michael Jackson, Martha Stewart, and Harvey Weinstein more recently. So I really, really want you to subscribe and see next week's video with her. Elizabeth Loftus is an incredible researcher, and you don't want to miss out on next next week's video where we talk about her work. Alright, thank you guys for watching, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye!